So Jeff, we thank you for coming online. Um, Jeff is the uh, senior pastor. Bath Calvary. Bath Calvary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's spoken to us before and it was so exciting. We said, please come back. And here we have him. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Jeff. And um, Jeff is the um, representative of Behold Israel in the UK. And he works with Amir Safati quite closely or very closely. And um, so a lot of us have been getting Amir Safati's reports from, um, Israel. from Israel and Galilee, where he's based. And uh, it's just so exciting to have one of his guys with us just to uh, bring us that Israel um, uh, connection. And also, um, Jeff has got the, uh, the insight into the prophecies that are going to unfold and come to pass. I think that's something Amir does. He speaks a lot about what is to come. And we, we, we move in at such fast speed in what's happening in Israel. You know, with the latest American election, there's been changes uh, in, in, in what is happening around. But Jeff will tell you all that. He's, he, he's more knowledgeable than me in that regard. And um, so, Jeff, just yeah. feel free. You know, feel okay. free and, and, and speak to us. Okay. Sounds sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, John. Okay. And we want to just open in prayer. Yeah, that's okay. exactly what I was going to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Heather, Heather, John. Heather and John, will you do that for us? Open us up. Oh, Lord, we want to say thank you for this time. Thank you. You brought us all together. Thank you, Lord, that you um, brought Jeff to, to speak to us, to to help us to understand in a greater detail about the end times, the prophecies, the unfulfilled prophecies, what you have to say to us, Lord. And we just ask you, Father God, to be with Jeff, to give him that sense of, um, of, of security in you that, that will just speak whatever he has to say on his heart, that he will be able to share. And we will have ears to hear and hearts to, that are vulnerable to receive everything that, that you want us to hear. So we just thank you, God, and bless him today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay. Well, as we get started, I'm going to actually share screen a little bit today and pull up a few um, different verses and a few different things as, as we're going to look at some different portions of Scripture. So let's, uh, let's begin with this, this point here. And it is to do with... Let me just little technical stuff here let me just move things around a bit okay so let's go ahead and, and look at this because what i want to make the point of first and foremost is something that for all of us as believers we want to be aware of and it's that almost a third so about 30 percent of the bible is prophecy is prophetic now many of those have been fulfilled many of those prophecies have been fulfilled obviously we could walk through the Old Testament scriptures and look together at all the messianic prophecies that we've seen Jesus literally fulfill perfectly. But one of the points I wanted to make with this is what we see here in these three different portions of scripture from Isaiah, when he is challenging, literally there's this challenge that's coming where God is actually saying, I want, because what? just a bit of context, you guys know that the nation of Israel was struggling because they were in a place of idolatry. And God is basically challenging them as a nation going, what are you doing? Like you are, I mean, remember the, remember the illustration he gives of you cut down a tree, you, you carve half of it into this idol, the other half you put in the fire to be burned, and then you bow down and worship this piece of wood. Like, th does that make sense? Like, think about it, guys. I mean, that's kind of how you can almost hear God's heart, you know, in that when we, when we read it in Isaiah. And so what he's doing is he's putting them to the test here. And he's saying, let me ask you a question about your, your, your idols, about your false gods, you know, present your case there in Isaiah 41, 21 to 24 says the Lord, bring forth your strong reasons, says the King of Jacob, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. So this is the God who made the world basically challenging you and me and saying, if you're worshiping anything else that can't tell you what's coming, then it's not God. <laughs> and, uh, and that's really what's coming out of this. He's saying, let them show you the things that have happened, what they were, that, they, that we may consider them, and to know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. And so there's where you see God 
giving this challenge saying if 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 your deity if your idol if you're whatever you're worshiping can't tell you what's coming in the future then you're is not a god who has who knows the end from the beginning who's the alpha and the omega who's outside of time and space and, and who is the creator and sustainer of these universe so show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you're gods yes do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it, it together indeed you are nothing and your work is nothing i mean he who chooses you is an abomination so god gives the kind of outcome of this knowing full well in many ways this is a rhetorical statement knowing they don't have the ability to do this and so truly the things that you're worshiping are nothing they are, are just made they're created you're worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator then of course you see there again in isaiah 45 21 to 23 god reiterating this point tell us bring forth your case let's take counsel together who's declared this from the ancient time who's who's the one who's told you all the things that are supposed to come it's me Who's told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there's no other God besides me. A just God and a Savior. There's none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And then, of course, I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow. And we know, again, reiterated for us in the New Testament, right? Every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then there's one more there in Isaiah 46, we see, again, God reiterating the same point about prophecy and how important it is. For I am God and there's no other. I am God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my judgment from a far country. Listen, I indeed have spoken it. I also will bring it to pass. I've purposed it. I also will do it. So, so I just wanted to start in this place because I think it's so important for all of us to understand that God himself is telling you and he's telling me. And, and honestly, if I'm, if I'm totally, you know, just candid with you guys, like this for me as just a believer is so helpful for my faith. Because when I realize that the Bible, that the scriptures, that this book we hold in our hand has about 30% of it is, is prophetic. And, and it's it's perfect in the sense that it's not just guessing it. Like, I think maybe something's going to happen kind of vaguely, you know, Nostradamus-like trying to tell us things that are going to come up to pass. But no, with exact accuracy and completely in line with 100 percent you know surety and accuracy we, we see that god's word has been fulfilled to the t when he said things were going to happen at the same exact time we know that there's still things that have yet to be fulfilled which for you and i again builds our faith because we've seen the faithfulness of god in the past when it comes to all the things he told us were going to happen and now here we sit today with things that are still future that we haven't seen fulfilled yet. But if he's been 100% accurate to this point and he's proven himself faithful to his word so far, well, you and I can stand with confidence and assurance that God's word will, you know, hey, the grass is going to wither, the flowers are going to fade, the word of the Lord is going to stand forever. And so it's going to be true. And that's something I just want to encourage all of us as believers to be able to to undergird ourselves with in a time and a day and age where we could look around and go, what is going on? And yet you and I have the assurance of the fact that God said <clears throat> these things would be taking place. And so we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be fearful. And we're going to look at that a little bit when we get, we're going to, we're going to move to Matthew chapter 24. So speaking of prophecy and unfulfilled prophecies, let's move together. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Now I need to work out how to, there we go. Okay. So it's the space bar. But before we get into 24, what we realize we're in a situation in this story where Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry, again, Jesus being God. Now let's keep this in mind as we read through all of this, because as we've just talked about the God who gave us prophecy has told us the end from the beginning. And, and again, we have to believe that Jesus is God. Now, if we don't believe that Jesus is God, then we're, we're not actually a believer. We're not actually a Christian. That's a, a whole nother Bible study. But, but the point being, you know, here we are. So what we have is God himself 
telling us some things. And, and the first one here, we see the heart of Jesus when he cries this prayer, you know, really over the city of Jerusalem, because as you know, he's been basically declaring some woes upon the religious leaders of the day, because they are rejecting him. They're refusing him. Even though he's speaking truth to them, he is reject. They are rejecting him. And so what we find is, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you and your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall not see me, you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, so now he's, he's prayed this prayer, he's made this cry, and he's, but he's also made some promises. He said, I, I've been making myself available to you as a nation, and yet you, you've refused me, so I am going away. And, and, and there's going to come a day where I'm coming back. You will see me again. This is kind of within this text. We see he's de- he is declaring, I am coming back, but you're not going to see me for a while. You're not going to see me until the day comes when you're going to declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and so this is setting the stage for us of what's coming next, because as we move into chapter 24, It starts with Jesus saying he went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. So, you know, they've walked out of the the, the temple courtyard area, out of the precinct of the court of the temple. They've moved through the Kidron Valley towards the Mount of Olives. And now his disciples are like wanting to talk about the fact that, you know, you've just said some things that are already kind of stirring us up, like, what's going on here? Well, now they're like, let's talk about this. I mean, this was an amazing structure. Well, he, he, Jesus responds to him and says, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this is huge, okay? Because what we see Jesus declaring is, this isn't going to stand. This isn't going to last. And He is giving prophecy. Once again, this is a prophetic word, right? About the fact that you're looking at the magnificence of this temple structure. And yet what you have to realize is as much as this might have been one of the most amazing buildings in the world at that moment, at that time, it's not going to be here. And and for those disciples, what that would have meant to them is like, what are you telling us? Almost to the point of like, if that's the case, that must mean when that happens, that's the end of the world. Like, because why would that happen? There's no other reason that would happen unless we were being completely and totally judged and, and the world was coming to an end. If you, if you put yourself in their sandals, you know, you, you'd realize that that's kind of what they must be thinking to themselves. Like, and the only way that that's going to happen is, is seriously, the world's coming to an end. So with that thinking, I just want to make a point about this very topic. Jesus gave a prophecy here. And, and for you and I, what, once again, as I started with, when we see fulfilled prophecy, it simply builds our faith. Well, lo and behold, you, you and I both know the story, right? A.D. 70, the Romans under Titus came down and sacked the city of Jerusalem. And, and as the story goes, that literally one of the, um, the possibility that one of the Roman soldiers was drunk and and by chance, you know, a fire was started in the in this uh, temple precinct. Either way, the, the, all the gold that was in the temple with this fire was dripping down through the rocks. And, and as the story goes, they, the Romans were like, we want that gold. You know, we're not going to go away without it. So they literally pulled one stone from another to get all the riches out of the temple. And that's why they literally took the whole thing down. It wasn't just because otherwise you kind of think they could have sacked the city without tearing down the temple. It didn't seem to make sense. It was a beautiful building, all this. But if that was to get the riches out of it, then that makes a lot more sense. So literally not one stone was left standing upon another. And lo and behold, what do we have here? But, and those of you who've traveled to Israel, even in our day, you know this. And I remember going years ago, and this was prior to this excavation. So it's been amazing to watch even over the last 30 years to see how this is down by um, the Davidson Center in uh, what would have been just under Robinson's Arch. And this is a literal original, you know, the, the ground you see there, the, the stones is a spot where we have this, they uncovered this pile of rocks, um, this pile of stones that were not one stone left standing upon another, even to the point that if you were to visit this and Lord willing, we'll be able to do that again one of these days, hopefully soon. 
um, one of them actually is marked with the capstone. In other words, it would have been at the top. It, it proves that this was a stone that was cast down from the very top of the temple precinct. So, so what we have here, which I love, and you know, as you and I sit here and look at this picture of these stones, we literally have fulfilled prophecy sitting right in front of us. That the fact that Jesus said not one stone would be left standing upon another, and here we've now unearthed the reality of a fulfilled prophecy, which again, as I said, should continue to build our faith. Because what we find is if this prophecy came to fruition and it came to pass, just like he said it would, well, what do you got to know? All the others that were still future are also going to come to pass. And that's where we have the confidence and it builds our trust and our faith that everything that Jesus has said will continue to happen. Now, what happens, as I said, is as his disciples have heard him say something like this, it's probably caused some consternation among the disciples because here they are in this place of thinking, we're following the Messiah. We've been chosen to be part of his you know, team, as it were. And, and so what a special place it is to be following Jesus. And yet he's making statements that are a little concerning in terms of like when people hear him say things like this, not one stone's going to be left standing upon another they might have been like, oh, that doesn't that doesn't go down well. I mean, you're the Messiah. Like, that people aren't going to think that's the coolest message ever. Um, can we have a word privately? <laughs> can we can we talk about this and 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 almost to the point where they don't really want to talk about it in public because it could kind of diminish their place and 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 situation being connected to a guy who who's saying things like this. They're like, hmm, what's what's he really saying here? So we read in there in verse three, right now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him, see that, privately, kind of like, um, Jesus, can we, can we have a word? You, you just made a statement that's pretty pretty significant, and we're not sure of the implications of what you're trying to say. But, but what it says to us is, by telling us things like this, that means the end of the world's coming. So when is that going to be? And that's where we see him ask these questions. And that you'll see on the screen that I've broken this down because I think there's something really important for us to understand here. Because as they ask these questions, they're basically saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So in essence, there's really three questions being asked. Now, for them, they might not have seen it as three questions. They might have been just looking at this and thinking they were just kind of asking one question. Like you said, there's coming a time um, when when all this stuff is going to, you know, well, not one stone's going to be left standing upon another. So, so that was one question. And then the other question was, you said, they're, we're not going to see you again until, you know, they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was a second question in this idea of like, okay, is that all going to happen at the same time? Because it seems like that would be the case. Now, what we actually see, and the reason I've broken this out is because it gives us incredible help and insight into how we look at Matthew 24. Because Jesus is answering these very questions that these guys have asked, but he's doing it in a way where they might not have understood exactly what he was doing, but he was explaining it to them in a, in a fashion where he basically starts with the third question first, answers that as you see the breakdown from verses 4 to 14. And then we're going to see the second portion where we see, and what will be the sign of your coming is now in verses 15 to 31. And then ultimately tell us when will these things be is actually at the, at the end. So, so it's, it's going like literally three, two, one, instead of one, two, three, he's answering it backwards, if you would. And, and that's why I want to give you this context, because as you see this and understand what Jesus is doing, I think it helps us to go, oh, okay, that's who he's talking to and when and what he's addressing. Because this Matthew 24, and you guys all probably know this, has been a confusing portion of scripture for a lot of people for a lot of years. And so what we find here is we begin in this portion where we see answering the question, and I'm just going to try and move my, uh, oh, just one second, I'm going to move our, because I, I can't see all that I've put up here. So I'm going to just move the video for a bit or my, of ourselves. Okay, there we go. And um, so Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that not, that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, 
what I want you to do is as you look at this portion of scripture from verses 4 to 14, be understanding and looking at it like Jesus is answering this third question that they've asked. What will be the sign of the end of the age? So this is, again, keep in mind, 2,000 years ago. And Jesus is saying to them, what, what, or sorry, they're asking Jesus, and he's responding to their question. Of They're asking, when will be the sign of the end of the age? Well, what we realize is he is giving, if you would, kind of a summary statement here of these are going to be the things that you're going to see that are going to give you clues into the fact that we're moving into that time frame. We're moving into that time period where the end is coming, where the end is near. And so that's what we see. And so understanding that there's going to be those who are basically false. There's going to be false teachers. There's going to be false prophets who are sadly going to deceive many. And, you know, what What do we have, you know, Paul writing to Timothy declares to us as well in, in um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, when he talks about the last days or the latter days, he says in chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will deceive, some rather, um, will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So so we have to be aware that in these last days, there's going to be deception running wild. Now, I don't know if I need to tell you guys that, (laughs) because I think personally, we are watching these things unfold in ways that a lot of us look on and go, well, what's going on? What, what, why are you believing that? You know, like, and, and, and when you're walking in the light and you're living in the truth, you know, again, we, we have a verse from uh, first Thessalonians that says, you're all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the darkness. You know, we, we will see things clearly when we're looking at the scriptures, but if somebody doesn't have the light of the truth of the word of God, a lot of this is going to be very confusing and, and they're going to be walking in darkness. It, it reminds me of times when I, Sometimes it happens to me. We live in an area where we're right on the fringe of the countryside and, and we have no light, that ambient light coming in from the outside windows or whatever. We block out curtains and everything. So there's nights where I'll wake up, you know, as you do in these older years, you know, maybe need the loo and, and uh, I'll be stumbling and bumbling over stuff. And, and that's kind of the picture is like people being in the dark, just not even sure where they're going or what they're doing. And so, so we see here that Jesus is telling us that's what it's going to be like as you get towards the end. But don't be troubled, because this is, I think, even maybe a word for all of us today. This is, I think, the Lord speaking to our hearts right this minute. Because because tell me, in this last you know 12 months, how many of us have been troubled over what we're watching unfold, what we're watching and seeing happen? But yet Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And, and so he's, again, showing us, for nation will rise against nation. And this idea is, is this understanding of ethnos against ethnos, which is really, it speaks to people groups like racial, you know, different. So it's a lot about civil war and, and how many, I mean, I've got figures and facts. I won't bring them all up today for you, but, but you could look at over the course of the last hundred years, how many civil wars have been fought, oh, you know, all these different, you know, segments of, of society and and all these things going on there's just tons and tons of these different kinds of civil wars at the same time kingdom against kingdom now this is talking world wars and this is something that hadn't happened you know before until the great war to end all wars except that we had another one <laughs> um and, and we had world war ii as well so so you see these kingdoms coming against kingdoms and so we also know famines well pestilences and here we are uh <laughs> sitting in our homes today um why why is that anyway and then earthquakes in various places and again there's figures to show just the the rapidity of and and intensity of how earthquakes have been increasing over the course of the last hundred years so jesus tells us all these are the beginning of sorrows and and what we know that to mean and what we know he said is this is the birth pangs these are the just like any of you ladies who who have you know had a baby you understand exactly what's being talked about here. Like there's those times where it gets, you know, the, the birth pangs start to increase and they start to get more intense and then they get more, you know, closer together. So they're actually getting closer together and they're getting more intense. And so with rapidity, they're coming, you know, fast and furious. 
And, and ultimately, Jesus is saying, this is all going to be part of what it's leading to. Then you'll deliver, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, I think it's important to make this point here, because Jesus is very, very clearly at this moment speaking to a Jewish audience. And I think, you know, because we're believers, because we're, you know, Christians, we we read our Bibles and we believe, you know, everything is written to us. And it is, it is in the sense that God, you know, everything is God breathed and it is for us as believers. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand the context of this because he is very much, and we're going to see this a little bit more as we keep going, that that this is a very much for a Jewish audience. And, and so as he's speaking there in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse, as we've referred to it, um, he's telling them, this is going to happen to you as a people group, as a nation. And, and we've seen this and we're going to continue to see this where the the jewish people have been hated by all nations and then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another now i just you know i don't know about you but in this last year again as we've watched events unfold how many people are offended uh, over this that and the other everything's an offense these days the cancel culture is running rampant and so it's like you say that i i I cancel you i shut you down you know or or betraying one another like even to the fact that the governments are encouraging people to tattletale on people who you know and and it's just you just see this kind of ultimately this hating one another i don't think we've been in a place in in our society at least in my life that i can remember where it, it, you know, I'll just give an example, and I might have even referenced this when I spoke to somebody in, in January, but like just watching this last election, like I grew up, you know, at least, you know, the U.S. election, I grew up in a, in a, you know, obviously in the states where Republican, Democrat, you know, I even worked in D.C. for three years and, and got to see kind of behind the scenes of all that up on the hill and everything. But um, you just think, you know it's one thing like there would be debate and there'd be questions and, and, and you kind of think, okay, we've got this, you know, group is in now. So things are going to change a bit, but then we got this other, you know, the Republicans are in or the Democrats are in and, and things shift back and forth kind of here in this middle ground sort of, yeah, we got a little bit more liberal and these things are going to happen more spending, yada, yada. And then other times, Oh, Republican. Okay. We're going to have more, less government, you know, more industry, whatever. So, so you'd have this kind of feeling back and forth through the, all these years. Well, I believe in this last year, what we've seen is it's no longer just kind of a marginal like change. It's become swing the pendulum to one extreme or the other to the point where no longer is it just, oh, I don't agree with you, but we can have a debate over it. It's I hate you and whatever you believe is just wrong. And so you don't have a say. And it's just gone well extreme, I think, in in many of these ways. But then we're also told that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And why? Because lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. And so as I was was just referencing, I believe we've been watching lawlessness abound. I mean, I don't have to tell you this. And this idea that the love of many will grow cold. Why? Because when lawlessness abounds, what happens is people start to lose hope. They just think, well, what's going to happen? We don't know because we can't count on truth to prevail any longer because we've just watched things go that feel like that was lawlessness, and yet nobody did anything about it. So we're in trouble. So so everybody start kind of out for themselves sort of feeling like, I, I, I can't count on you to defend me anymore. I can't c- trust you that you're going to look out for my best interest. So I have to like take care of myself and I have to fend, my, fend for myself. And And so this idea of every man for himself sort of feeling and the love of many growing cold, it's like, I can't worry about you anymore. I got to just worry about me because I can't trust the system. And, and it's just this, this animosity that continues to build. But again, this is again, speaking to the nation of Israel. And, and what I say here is, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus here is speaking to the fact that they're talking to the Jewish people that there is going to be, and we're going to see this as we understand, it's going to talk about this tribulation period as he gets into the next section. And it's talking about the fact that Jacob's trouble of what uh, Jeremiah 30 verse 7 talks about, that there's going to be this time of trouble or Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 that is coming upon the earth. And this the Jews who, who put their faith, they realize, wait, 
this false prophet, this antichrist that rises up that the, the, many of the Jews are putting their trust in, those who don't put their trust in him, they will survive and they will endure. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Now, how's that going to happen? Well, it tells us, as we see in, um, whether it's in Revelation 11, talking about the two witnesses that are going to be there in Jerusalem, or in Revelation 7 through and, and 14, it talks about the 144,000 Jewish believers, evangelists, who are going to be preaching this gospel. Even one step further, you could say, and then there's going to be an angel that tells us about that's flying through heaven, declaring the everlasting gospel. So the point is, the gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness before Jesus comes back. Okay, so, so this is a summary statement. If you could see this as like literally saying, you're going to see all these things happen. This is going to be the kind of precursor to it all. You're going to see all these, these, um, um, birth pangs. You're going to see all these stuff, you know, beginning of sorrows. These are things you have. And then it's going to culminate in the fact that I will come back at the end. So this is giving us kind of a summary of the whole. Okay. There's a big picture here in these first portion. Now, as we move into the next bit, their, 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 their second question, which is answered, second, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, again, keep in mind, a very Jewish audience, because Jesus is saying this, there's a tribulation period. There's Daniel's, you know, seventh, uh, 69th to the seventh week, that last seven year period of time that needs to be fulfilled of the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter nine. And so therefore, when you see, he tells us from Daniel chapter um you know, uh, I got this thing. Let me just, I got the thing blocking my screen again. Just a second. I just need to move it around a little bit. A little technical difficulty here. There we go. All right. Um, there we are. So when, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place. And again, this is where whoever reads, let him understand. So you need to go back to Daniel chapter nine and understand what Jesus is talking about here. Then let those who are in Judea, and so what we'll do is, let me see if I can uh, do this. Hopefully I know how to get back to the verse. So this is this is Daniel chapter 9, okay? So what did Jesus, what do we know? He's referring to this portion of scripture where he's saying that when Daniel was praying to the Lord and repenting and, and just praying for his people, the angel came to him and spoke to him and declared these words that God wanted Daniel to understand. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation, reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. So that means there's sixty-nine weeks. Okay. 483 years, the street shall be built again and the wall even in so troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So, so this takes us right up until the time where Jesus arrived on the scene, that Jesus came after these 69 weeks or these 483 years from the time of going back into Jerusalem to rebuild the city and all to when Jesus arrived. But he was cut off, but not for himself. So he died on the cross, not for himself, but for you and me. And then the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. This is now speaking about the, uh, the Antichrist. Shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, talking about Jerusalem. And the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war of the desolations are determined. So this is just referring to, this is the abomination of desolation that's going to be talked about. Because he says, what's going to happen is you're going to have this guy who's going to rise up, who's going to be seen as like a Messiah for the nation of Israel. And he's actually going to confirm a covenant for one week, which is the seven-year period of time. There's going to be a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, this covenant. And they're going to believe this is our Messiah. This is the one. He's, he's our Savior. And even now, we watch, and as we're seeing in the nation of Israel, like people are being primed for a Messiah. Like they're looking for that Savior. I mean, how many how many elections now? Is it four, four elections in two years? Is that right? So, so, you know, here we are going into another one. So, so the idea is they're seeking someone to, to, to lead them and guide them, and we need, we need answers. And, and so he's, he tells us he's going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the cult consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So what it's referring to is 
for three and a half years, he's going to be Israel's best friend. They're going to think, oh my goodness, he's helping us rebuild our temple. He's our savior. He's our Messiah. He's the guy. And then there's going to come a time at the three and a half year point where it tells us here that he is going to come in and he is going to declare himself as God. Second Thessalonians chapter two talks about this, where as this antichrist figure is going to come in and say, I'm God, you're going to worship me. And that's when the Jewish people, the nation of Israel are going to realize their mistake. They're going to understand, oh my goodness, this is not our savior. He's not our Messiah. And they're going to run for their lives. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, you need to, to get away from this guy because he's bad news. Um, and so what we see is the fact that he tells them that let those, when you realize this is happening, when you see this antichrist figure coming in and you understand he is basically causing the abomination which creates desolation, which is the fact that he's declaring himself to be God there in the temple, which was spoken of by Daniel. Then those who are in Judea, so this is clearly for Jewish audience, flee to the mountains. Let him, him who's on the housetop not go down, take anything out of his house. And let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Again, Jewish audience. Winter in Jerusalem, been there. It's pretty, it can be pretty grim. And, and of course, on the Sabbath, things can be closed down. It can be difficult to, to travel about. For then there will be great tribulation. Here it is. What he's referring to is that seven-year period of time referred to as Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, Daniel chapter 12. Here we saw the, the you know, seven years that was talked about in Daniel 9. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, here's where we just need to stop for a minute and make some clarity or create some clarity for you, because I think this is really important when it comes to understanding what's being what's going on here, because this is where people have gotten confused because they think, well, the elect, clearly that's talking about the church, because we're the elect, right, as the church. And yet it's so important to understand that this context, he's very clearly speaking to Jews. He's very clearly speaking to the nation of Israel. He's just got done telling them about the abomination of desolation that was appointed very specifically in Daniel 9 for Israel as a people and the city of Jerusalem. And it was clear in Daniel 9. So, so the seven years, that last seven-year period from the 70 weeks, was never for the church. So this isn't about the church. This is clearly for the nation of Israel that he's talking to. And when we talk about elect, it's back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, where we understand God was talking to the nation of Israel, and he called them the chosen people. And so we, we see that, that he, when he's talking about elect, the nation of Israel are his elect. They are his chosen people because he's speaking to them at this moment, and he's telling them during this tribulation period, there will be those who survive. There will be those who, who make it through, um, but at the same time, if I, if I didn't shorten things, you wouldn't. But that's who he's talking to. He's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to the nation of Israel. Then if anyone says, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Again, the, the, those that are the believers, the, the Jewish people. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore... If they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together immediately. Now here's where we see Jesus taking it to the end of the seven-year tribulation period. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, what's the answer to, to this question? They, he said, I'm going away, and you're not going to see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he is answering their question, what will be the sign of your coming? Well, guys, it's going to be at the end of the seven-year tribulation period when I'm coming back to the earth for my people. So then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one, hand, well, from one end of heaven to the other. Now we're talking about his return 
to the earth. And Jesus has shown us that, you know, and we're going to look at this a little bit in a minute, the fact that his church, his bride, are already with him. And so now he's saying from heaven, the church is going to come and gather with the Lord as he comes to return to earth to rule and reign upon the earth, as Revelation talks about. So, so this section has been, when are you coming? When, when's the sign of your coming? Well, it's going to be at the end of the tribulation period, at the end of this seven-year period of time. That's when I'm coming. That's why he gives us all this context of the seven-year tribulation period. Okay, and then we're going to move to the next portion, which is this question that they asked, which was, Tell us, when will these things be? Now, this is really, really important. And it's important for you and me at this moment because he's answering this last question for them. And he is giving you and me some significant insight and some context here when it comes to understanding what's going on. Because we understand at this point that this is a time in history. You'll know, you'll see when these things will be. When this happens, what happens? Verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. What is Jesus referring to here? He's saying when this event happens, when the fig tree buds and its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, then you'll know that you're in the last days. You'll know that you're in the time when these things will take place. Well, for you and me, what we understand is what Jesus was referring to here is the parable of the fig tree is the fact that the nation of Israel has been pictured in the Old Testament as the fig tree, that he is speaking about the nation of Israel. Jesus also talked about the nation of Israel when he was talking about the fig tree that he was going to judge, you know, because it wasn't bringing forth the fruit. That was using the fig tree as that example of the national identity of the nation of Israel. And what we realize is Israel has become a nation again. Now, this is something that, as we know, was talked about there in Ezekiel. Chapter 36, God told us 2,500 years ago through the prophet Ezekiel that there would be a time in the future, again, prophecy that would take place where the nation of Israel would be scattered throughout the nations and they were going to be dispersed as God said they would because they had profaned his holy name. But he promises that he's going to bring them back to their land. And as you see here before us, for I will take you from among the nations gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land, back to the land of Israel. God was promising to bring them back. And so so here we have this promise that he was making that they would be back in their land, just like we see here when he's saying that there's a day coming when the fig tree is going to bud again as well. We also see as, okay, yeah, we'll go back here. Um, And then we we know from, uh, I think I got the wrong slide in order here um just a minute there it is okay (laughs) okay there we go so he also talks about the fact of who, who who's coming back he says to them son of man these bones he gives this illustration of the valley of dry bones you guys are familiar with this i'm sure and the fact that the whole house of Israel is this dry, valley of dry bones, it's a, really, I mean, it's amazing how it's a picture for us. I mean, if you've seen news footage or, or different video or, well, I think it would be film from back, you know, at the Holocaust and just those, sometimes you see these graves or if you've been to the Holocaust Museum and you see just bones, literally people who are just bones and skeletons, you know, piled up high and just the 6 million people who were killed. And, and you just see this idea that the nation of Israel, you know, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. And yet God says, I'm going to breathe life into you once again. And son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, he tells us here. 
Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. God was promising this 2,500 years ago that these things would happen. So much so, he says, I will do this. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I'm going to place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord, Ezekiel 37, and, and verse 14. And so, so what we understand here is the fact that, you know, what we've been learning is that he's telling us there's coming a day when the, the fig tree is going to bud. And that's the prophecy that has been fulfilled, which seemed impossible, you know, for thousands of years. And, and so much so that, you know, replacement theology became a thing back in the third century based on the fact that the Jews were out of the land and they just assumed, well, God must be done with them. And so we must be the church that's replaced Israel. But, but we know that not to be the case because God said, no, I'm not doing that. That's not how it works. Even Paul wrote about it in Romans, right? That, that he's not done. They're the, the original olive tree. And, and so he's got a plan and a purpose spiritually for them as a nation. Either way, May 14th, 1948, in fulfillment of what Isaiah even asked the question, can a nation be born in a day? Well, God's answer is, of course, again, because he did it. And that's where we see the, the fig tree has budded. So for you and I, because people, you know, you get like these verses in Peter where it talks about, oh, people have been saying Jesus is coming back forever, you know, the scoffers and all that. But, you know, for you and me sitting here today, we are a generation that has seen this take place. We now have seen the nation of Israel come back into the land and be born again, if you would, fulfilling this uh, prophecy that God gave about Ezekiel, from Ezekiel. And with that understanding, we realize, well, then this isn't like any other time in history, because now we're in those very days that Jesus promised we would be. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, he says, now talking to those that were believers. How do we know this? He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the son of man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the son of man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. You see that? That is telling us where it talks about your Lord. It's saying this is a believer. Now he's speaking to believers, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. But know this, that if the master of the house had not known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So what he's referring to here is he's referring to what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he talks about the fact that the Lord is going to come with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. The word there in the Greek, harpazo, to be you know snatched quickly from the, you know, the Latin Vulgate is where we get the word rapturus, and, and so that's the word rapture. And it's speaking to the fact that Christ is going to come for his bride, because he said in John chapter 14, I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be also. So he's going to come and get his bride, bring his bride to be with him in heaven, and then will come this last seven-year period of time, as it talks about in Revelation, the, the seven-year period that is prophesied in Daniel that the nation of Israel, God is still working with the nation of Israel. He's not done with them yet. He wants to bring them to a saving knowledge of himself, reveal himself as their Messiah. But the, but what you need to know, what I need to know is when are these things going to be? It's going to be once the nation of Israel has been back in the land, then we should be watching. <laughs> we should be knowing as believers because our Lord, as it so says here, is coming. And that's for you and me. So we should know that this is when all this stuff is going to happen. Because who, who then is faithful and a wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master's delaying is coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him at an hour that he's not aware of. 
and will cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so what we understand is the Lord is, is giving us a, you know, an understanding here that we are to be aware of the fact that as the church, as the bride of Christ, there's a time that will come. So as a, just a kind of a, almost a summary or a, just looking at these verses together, the question that was asked right at the beginning, right? What will be the sign of the end of the age? We saw that Jesus was giving us a big picture, kind of this is from the, the, the birth pangs right up until the delivery. This is the whole picture. You're going to see it. But then when we see what will be the sign of your coming, he's speaking very specifically to the nation of Israel, and that it's going to be at the end of the tribulation period. You're going to go through the seven years that is still appointed to you because you guys have missed your Messiah, but I'm going to reveal myself to you, and the gospel is going to be preached, and the Jews are going to come, as, as uh, Zechariah 14 tells us, there's coming that day when Jesus will return, and they will recognize him as the one they've pierced, and they're going to see him as you know their Messiah. And when will these things be? Well, it's going to be after the nation of Israel is back in the land. And that's going to be a sign to you and me as believers, those who are putting our faith and trust, that you need to be looking up because your redemption draws nigh. Your redemption draws near. And so as we look at all that, what we see is the fact that these things will come to pass. Now, as we sit here today, stop, share for a minute. As you and I sit here today, um, we, we see that we're in a situation where the events that are taking place, because we know that the nation of Israel is back in the land, Ezekiel 36 and 37. And as you know, what comes after Ezekiel 36 and 37? Well, obviously, 38 and 39. And with that, we also know that there's a, a coalition of co countries that are going to come against the nation of Israel now that they're back in the land. And, and they're going to be prosperous during that time. And as Ezekiel 38 tells us, it's going to be Russia. Gog and Magog coming from the north. It also gives us an insight into Tagarma and, and Tubal and Tobolsk is, is just looking at Turkey as being part of that. At the same time, it tells us Persia is going to be a part of that. Well, we all know that this is Iran uh, of old. And, and so Persia and then Sudan and Libya. And so as we see all these countries, you know, we just have to think to ourselves, well, you and I now know as we've looked at all this, that these events that Jesus told us are going to happen are all going to happen after the nation of Israel are in the land. Well, here we are today watching events unfold in ways that I, you know, have been amazed by literally in, in within a 12 month period to see how things have unfolded so quickly when it comes to some of the dealings in the Middle East, in Israel specific, when you had the deal of the century back at the beginning of last year with president Trump and just creating this, you know, moving the, moving the, um, the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, acknowledging the Golan Heights as, you know, as part of Israel. And now, you know, the Judea Samaria and all that was going on with that. And then ultimately getting into the Abraham Accords with these other Muslim nations, with uh, UAE, with Bahrain, um, even, you know, Morocco, not as relevant in, in our discussion, but nonetheless, just watching all this unfold. And to know that there's no way Bahrain or UAE really would have entered into these unless they had the approval of, of Saudi Arabia, which shows us that they also have that. And just even in the last few days, Netanyahu has made it clear that they're expecting four more nations to join in, into this piece. How does this all play into the Ezekiel 38 and uh, 39 scenario that there is this war that will eventually be coming. When will it happen? We don't know, but there is something that's going to come where God has told us in Ezekiel 30 and 39, he is going to step in and he is going to defend the nation of Israel. Now, up until this point, you and I have always thought, okay, well, obviously the United States would be a defense for Israel because they would stand with Israel. But when we read Ezekiel 38 and 39, we go, it doesn't look like anybody stands with Israel. It doesn't appear that anyone's going to be with them. So what does that mean for us? How, how on earth would Israel, you know, the U.S. not stand with Israel? I don't think I need to tell you. I think we're finding ourselves in those days uh, more and more by the day. Um, that, that now we're, we're wondering how is this all going to play out? Well, what I just want to, you know, kind of big picture it talks about in Ezekiel 38, Sheba and Dedan, and how when this event takes place where these nations are going to come against the, you know, Israel, that 
Sheba and Dedan, which is the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, are going to be looking on saying, what are you guys doing? And you're coming for plunder, aren't you? But they don't get involved in the, in the fight. They don't get involved in the war, which again, in the past, some would say, why not? They're Muslim nations. You'd think that they would want to come against Israel as well. But more and more now we just look at current events and go, oh, well, this is why they wouldn't. They wouldn't get involved because they're at peace with Israel. That Israel's now become a, a major partner. And, and literally, we're watching trade and everything prosper just dramatically with Israel. So, but yet what we do know is there is one country in the Middle East right now that's causing a whole lot of stink. And uh, it's the nation, you know, of Iran, as you know, Persia. And this is going to be where, again, Netanyahu has made the statement that he's like, we're not going to let them continue to keep getting stronger and stronger because we realize now we don't have America's support any longer. So we're having to step up and be our own best, you know, strength. We can't count on America anymore. We can't count on anybody anymore. I mean, obviously we're looking to these other Arab countries for, for this um, mutual kind of commerce and everything else. But ultimately when it comes to our defense, we need to be our own defense. And that's where we are seeing them being isolated more and more in the Middle East than we've ever seen before. And under the new administration, we realize that they're partnering with Iran, like, well, like we would have expected because we knew that they'd already been doing that kind of the same leaders that we had for eight years prior to the last four years. And, uh, and so it's the same people back in place doing the same exact things, you know, getting back to the um, agreements with Iran to, to be able to enrich uranium. We've seen that they're literally enriching uranium at a, at a breakneck speed to the point of trying to get to weapons grade. So, so we know that there is this continued tension. Now we know that Israel has also said, we're going to keep taking, you know, whatever measures are needed for stopping Iran because we are like, you know, basically our lives are on the line. They've already said they want to wipe us off the map. They're happy to, you know, drive us into the sea. So, so we know that's already their intention. So we can't let them get there. We can't let them do that. So we see that Israel is going to keep taking every, you know, precaution and doing everything they can to protect themselves. Now, as, as we think about that, I just thought to myself, I think there's going to be this constant back and forth as we're seeing Israel continue to bomb there in Syria, any kind of these Iran proxies that are there in Syria, obviously with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, the, the Houthis are down in Saudi Arabia, also supported by Iran, and they're coming against Saudi Arabia, ultimately trying to get to the holy places, Mecca and Medina, to make them you know their own Shiite um, holy places. But but either way, what we find is, is this just tension is going to keep going. And I just wonder, and I'll just throw this out there. I just wonder if Israel will be able to keep rebuffing, keep rebuffing Iran until a point comes where there comes this day where Russia starts looking and going, we want to take some of this plunder because we know that Israel is becoming very prominent. They've got the pipeline, you know, the, the East Med pipeline that's going into Europe now, which is creating competition for Russia. They don't like that because they like to have a monopoly over the, the natural gas. Um, did I say, well, I don't know, the natural gas pipeline that's going into Europe. But now that Israel is running natural gas into Europe, they're creating this competition where no longer does Russia hold such sway over Europe, which they don't like at all. So they, it does make us wonder, is that going to be the, the hook in the jaw that draws Russia down to fight with Israel to basically take over there? Whatever it is, that's where you could see then, you know, Israel can keep fighting against Persia, keep fighting against Iran all this time, keep rebuffing everything that they're doing. But there, there's there ultimately come a day where Russia says, actually, we want to we want to take out Israel. And Iran's like, yeah, we're with you. You know, we've been trying to do all this stuff now. We're going to join you. And then Turkey's right there with Erdogan. I don't know if it'll be him at the time, but, but you know, we see that they're all, they're game on, you know, to come and try and become this caliphate that he wants to be there in in the middle east and so so you have all this happening at the same time and then of course the the influence that's in in libya for russia and iran right now or in turkey sorry and um and then sudan as well being a muslim nation and just drawing them into the into the fray so so it is a lot of interesting pieces of the puzzle that we're watching literally unfold before our very eyes because one of the things that we always wondered was like Sheba and Dedan don't do anything. And now we realize, oh, I think that's why. Now some have wondered now, why doesn't America do anything? Well, 
I think this last year and the decline of America and what we're watching unfold with all the pressures that are being placed is, is more and more showing us that there's probably going to be a different kind of sentiment towards Israel for, for some time. And, and so that's possible why that's going to be the way it is. Also, um, in terms of, uh, you know, because it talks about these, like the the young lions, and some people have thought, does that mean that's that's America? Because it, you know, it was born out of England, and the lions of England. Don't know, don't don't, don't know if that's what's being referred. Because people always go, is American Bible prophecy? It doesn't seem to be, other than maybe that possible, you know, the young lions of of uh, of Tarshish or whatever. You know, either way. Um, so I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray, and and we're gonna open up to Q and A. Maybe we'll just take a quick break, a uh, little maybe uh, yeah. refreshment break, and then uh, yeah, and then we'll and then we'll have some time to to do Q and A as well. So let me pray. Father, thank you for this time to be looking at your word. I know it's a lot, Lord. I just threw out a bunch of stuff, and so I just pray that the time now of just maybe having some Q and A and talking through it would bring some clarity to some of these thoughts, um, and that people hopefully would be encouraged to know that Jesus. You've told us the end from the beginning, and, and we have confidence. We don't have to be troubled. Our hearts don't need to be afraid right now as we watch the events unfold in our world because you've told us what's coming, and we can have confidence that you're in total control. But we want to be looking for your soon return, Jesus. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, yeah, we'll take a quick break. Yeah. And I think let's come back at so uh, quarter past. Uh, so that's uh, 11 uh, minutes. Uh, for questions. Sounds great. <laughs> Right, okay, so if everyone just mute again. If you've, um, if you've got a question, the best way is to put it in the chat box, and then we can pick those questions up. Jeff's going to go through and, and answer as many as he can. That was Jeff, that was fantastic. I think, as Simon said, it was a big download, so we... Yeah, I kind of I kinda we, felt like that. I felt like it's a lot, and I get that. But, and, but, it was you know. fantastic. We only we have, we only have, have limited time together. We only have limited time together. So I felt like, here you go. <laughs> That's great. Go. We can sort through it um, together. So, so let's let's do a couple things. Um, one, I just with Heather, you you actually name the nations again um, involved in in uh, Ezekiel thirty eight war. I'll just throw that out there just to answer that quickly. That um, and sorry, Jeff, I'm going to just interrupt you. There might be some people who don't know what that what Ezekiel 38 says. So you yeah. did say it, but if you just summarize very briefly what it is. Okay. And, you know, sorry about the also the technical side of this. It was it was a bit of a challenge for me figuring out. And I, I saw the notes that people said my color palette was still up. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, so let's see here. There we go. So I'm going to uh, share screen again because I do have I do actually have the verses in Ezekiel 38 here in my in my. Uh, so here's here's where. Uh, we'll just look at it this way. So. Um, it's saying to us here, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. So this is speaking about Russia and that region of the north, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I'm going to turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and I'm going to lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So this is where we see also Persia and then Ethiopia is really, if you look at what, you know, previous, you know, land of Ethiopia would have been, it's, it's modern day Sudan and then Libya. Um, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma speaking to us of, um, of Turkey. Now, some, I just want to throw this out. I don't know, but I, I'm not, you know, I can't confirm it or, or not, but some have even thrown in there that Gomer could be Germany. Um, but you know, from different studies that people have done. And I know this is all debatable, but the point is, I think we are pretty confident. We know it's, it's Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, and Sudan. Those are going to be the five nations uh, that are very specifically coming against Israel. And which, which I find is interesting in light of the fact that we don't have, um, I just always find it kind of curious by their absence, really. No Lebanon, no Syria, no Jordan, no Egypt, you know, so you got all these immediate neighbors, none of them are joining in the fray. It's coming from further afield. And it just shows you, I think right now, I mean, you just maybe if you if you're following Amir, you know, on his updates, but also if you're following him on Telegram, I would encourage you if you're not 
to follow him here on Telegram as well. If you can download that, if you don't have it, because he's given daily updates and bits and pieces. And one of the things that we're seeing is like Lebanon, for example, their economy is just crashing. Right now, it's 16,000 lira to a, to a U.S. dollar, which is insane. Um, so, so they're basically, you know, so you're seeing these nations really in, in bad shape. And so it just makes you beg the question and wonder, you know, again, why they're not involved. It might be that might be part of it. Now, you still have Hezbollah there, of course, trying to, you know, a, a, a Iranian proxy trying to rule things. But either way, so those are the those are the nations. Um, but here down in verse 13, you see Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish. So, so this idea that um, those regions, you know, of that land aren't coming in. So the, the whole Saudi Arabia peninsula they're not getting involved which is which is interesting so that was kind of what we were discussing earlier so i'll i'll move to this one i think uh, judy asked the question does it make a difference who wins the elections in israel and what is the significance of the pope's recent visit okay i'll do the pope first and then we'll and then we'll talk about the elections you know i i did something not long ago with uh simon barrett on revelation tv we talked a little bit about the pope speaking there in the ur or of the Chaldees, um, of all places, right, where Abraham was from, and why they chose that area, because we see what they're trying to do is this sense of he is trying to create this ecumenical one world kind of religious system. And going back to Ur of all places, because of Abraham, he's trying to unite all the religions by saying, you know, you, these are the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam, and um Christianity, and it started with Abraham, right? So, so let's go back to the roots, and and we can find a place of common ground that we all have Abraham as a forefather. Yeah, obviously, you and I both know that you can say something's monotheistic, so it's one God, but it doesn't mean it's the same God. And as we know from the history books, um, that that Islam started as a worship of of Allah, which is a moon god uh, that that Muhammad picked out of a group of over hundreds of, of gods that he chose to worship. And so it's not, it's not Jehovah. He's, you know, the one God that Islam is worshiping is certainly not the God of the Bible. Um, and I think that's an important point just to, just to make in light of that. So yet we do see a, 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 a Pope right now who is very much a globalist. Um, also, we, we understand that his goal is to, you know, he's very in line with everything that the world economic forum is doing and, 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 uh, climate change and all the agendas towards a one world kind of system. And, and so that's part of it is this one world religion that's laying the groundwork. So, so it is very curious of all places to go back to Iraq. Um, and, and, you know, some have thrown in there now, Ooh, Babylon is in Iraq. Okay. What does this all mean? You know, so again, don't, don't have anything more to say about that at this point, but we'll just watch and see. Uh, but we definitely know he's laying the groundwork for kind of this mindset of a one world kind of belief system where everybody could just be, you know, regardless of your beliefs, you can just kind of put those aside and we can all just get along and love one another and look after the planet together and everybody will be happy. We'll be global citizens together and that'll be enough. But again, contrary to scripture, and he is not, you know, the things he says are curious because obviously some people are going, Oh, is he the, is he the false prophet of, of revelation? Wouldn't go there. Um, at this point, <laughs> not going to make that statement. Uh, but at the same time, what you see is a very, you know, definitely that kind of thinking where someone, it tells us in revelation 13, he's going to, he's going to, um, look like a lamb, but speak like a dragon in, in the idea that there's going to be humility or come across as humble and loving and caring. But the things he says are antichrist. They are from the devil, from the dragon himself. And so, so it is curious, a lot of what the, the Pope's doing right now and the things he's saying, you got to really watch him because he's, he's definitely, uh, you know, got some real issues there with, with what, what he, what he's doing. Now, when it comes to the elections, I think what we find is if it's not Netanyahu, everybody else is really progressive, which again, I feel like has been kind of the goal, get rid of Trump, Netanyahu and Trump have been the only two nationalists in the world right now. Everybody else is, you know, we should all become one. We got to work globally, and and so we see that there's a push to get rid of Netanyahu. So yes, if if he is removed, I do believe, per, you know, the progressive agenda that we're seeing in the states now with Biden. I mean, just even even watching what's happening right this minute, where it's coming out that um, he's re-engaging the Palestinians in terms of once again, hundreds of millions back to the, to that whole effort. 
um, even though they weren't willing to do anything uh, to to do their part um, towards peace. But nonetheless, just going right back to the same old, same old of what, what we've seen in the past. And so it is curious to know that if there is a is a progressive government, how much more is that going to hinder, or at least because we see Netanyahu's no nonsense. Um, I don't know if you know this. I uh, he actually Netanyahu spoke at a Calvary Chapel church in Florida years ago, and um, the reason being it was in between his time of being prime minister the first time and the second time, and he felt very strongly uh, when he when he gave up Hebron, he gave up land for peace, and it failed because. It never works um, because they'll always want more. It's never enough because ultimately the goal is get rid of Israel. So so it doesn't matter how much land you give up, they're still going to demand more. And because of that, when he gave up Hebron, he realized it didn't it didn't work. It was kind of a bit of a disaster. He felt, and this is his own his own testimony. He felt very strongly that God spoke to him and and told him that that he was going to be prime minister again, and he's never ever to give up land uh, ever again. And, uh, and so what, what happens is, you know, he, he got, I tell you this because I, I watched him speak at this church in, in Florida. He wanted to just speak to Christians because he knew that they are supportive, you know, of, of, of Israel. But in talking about that, I thought that was really insightful because we've watched a man who, when he did get back into that role, has, has been very unwilling to compromise in this area anymore because he feels like he has a divine, you know, kind of mandate on, on him not to give up land for peace because it just doesn't work. And so he's been very strong in that. And that's where I wonder if he was removed and the progressive agenda does move forward, where does that leave us? Where what what will that next person be willing to do? Or how strong will they stand against Iran as well? That's the other one. Um, because again, he knows that, that there's no no nonsense. He's not messing around. He's not going to wait for other people to defend he's not going to worry about what europe says and he's not going to he can't they can't their 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 survival is on the line so so that's where i i don't know so if we get somebody progressive it it is probably a concern because they will move towards the you know same kind of globalist agenda but at the same time um it's hard to know beyond that um okay this is <laughs> james james McNeil has is or Neely James McNeely uh, has asked a question. I'm particularly interested in how you think Revelation thirteen seventeen, no man will buy or sell, might play out in the coming years because this area is moving incredibly quickly. You're absolutely right. Um, so for me, this is this is my take. Now, obviously, and then I'll say this right off the bat, and I think I might have probably already said it in, in January, but I'll say it again. This vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Let's just be clear. Okay, let's start there because you need a beast to have a mark of the beast. And we don't have a beast. And, and we're not in that place yet. But I will say what we're watching unfold in our world is priming the pump, is definitely preparing people. Because we've never, I mean, literally, like I, I think I have alluded to this, that when we've read Revelation for all these years, studied it, taught it, you know, you, you get to these points where it says things like that, where nobody's going to be able to buy or sell without this mark. And you kind of think to yourself, how is that ever going to work? Like, how could you ever get the world to a place where people would all agree to that? Like, we, it just didn't feel almost, it felt a little far off or a little bit distant or a little bit unfeasible until now, <laughs> until the last year where, oh no, you can't go into the shop without this thing, or you can't, travel on this airline without this, you know, vaccine, whatever the case might be. So, so what we're finding is our world is being primed for, you can't do this unless you have that. And, uh, and it's coming more and more and, and it's built out of fear. It's always built out of fear. And, you know, the control that's desired is going to be, that's why we have so much fear mongering is because we need people to get in line with, with our agendas. And so the only way they're going to do that is if they're living in fear, they'll do whatever we tell them because we have their best interest in mind. And, and so, so when you ask that question, how are we going to get there? Well, 
for me, as I look on at our, our current situation, we've known in the World Economic Forum and the guys, you know, the, the elites and the powers that be have been pushing for this for a while now where they've, it's so funny how people keep, they'll come out with like, oh, the immunity passport or, oh, oh uh, you know, no um, cashless society or, or a global immunization or all these things as if we just came up with this great idea, guys, this is the real solution. And you're like, um, I've read your documents. You've been talking about this for 20 years. Like Gavi, you know, Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunization started 20 years ago. The British government is the one that highly has funded that with the Gates Foundation. So so we know you've been wanting to do this for years. And it's kind of this Hegelian dialect. If you never looked that up, I would encourage you to look up what Hegelian dialect is. It's this idea of um, problem, reaction, solution. So it's like we want to get you to a synthetic solution. We want to get you to a solution that we desire. So we're going to create a problem. Then we're going to get a reaction from you of what you you need. And then by getting that reaction, we're going to provide you with a solution to your problem. And, and so much of what we're watching happen in our world right now, all these solutions that are being provided for us are things that they've been pushing for for, for a long time. So it's no real surprise. And so even this idea of like a cashless society has been what the Bank of International Settlements has been pushing for. I remember reading an article in March of last year, right when this all kicked off, right? When everything started happening, the one thing they said was, I couldn't believe it, but I read it and it just said, well, at least one of the silver linings of you know this whole event is that maybe we'll be able to move to a cashless society. So, so that was already their goal. We know in 2016, the World Economic Forum was saying very clearly, we do not want America as the superpower in this world. They want it to be you know, more just all bunch of different countries all working and, and ruling together. So this kind of globalist agenda again. So when it comes to that, what we find is we definitely see a push right now. And this is why the hyperinflation is on its way, I think, for America. And specifically because of all this quantitative easing, what you've got is just printing money. 20% of all the money that's in America right now has come into being in the last year. 20% of all of, of money that's ever been, you know, dollars that have been made. And so what you see is a push to get rid of the U.S. dollar as the uh, global reserve currency. So that way then they can move to something that, uh, you know, all the countries and, and you know, China, obviously, and, and others are, are pushing towards this because they don't want America to be able to weaponize their money and use it as like when like Iran had sanctions on them and these sorts of things. So they ultimately want to remove America as this as this dominant superpower. And so what you have moving towards is what we're seeing unfold before our eyes is is this what I believe will happen, because obviously with blockchain technology, the way it's moving towards a digital currency is I know people are getting kind of some people get excited, like, oh, well, you got Bitcoin and all this where you're going to be able to de be decentralized. No longer the bank's going to have control. It's going to be libertarian. Everybody can be their own, you know. To a point, there's there's some of that, but the truth is, I don't believe that's ever going to be the way it is because we know what Revelation 13 says. They're going to always have control. And so what I see is, yes, the technology, blockchain technology and all is working and it is going to continue to be the way forward, digital, you know, you know these digital rails, but the banks will still control because I know they'll do that by way of a, a central bank digital currency um, because... What we see, it's already happening in China right now. They've already airdropped the yuan to their people so that they can have, you know, this this digital currency. But now when you look at that, you think, OK, well, that, that seems convenient. It seems easy. You know, we already are using debit cards and all this stuff anyway. So a lot of what we do is already kind of digital. So this just seems to, to even um, make the process even quicker and more streamlined. But what you also have to understand with a digital currency now what you're dealing with is every single transaction that anyone makes is fully tracked and traced. So everything that's happening with money is being able to be watched and seen and you can be turned off. And that's where I see this moving. You know, when it talks about you can't buy or sell without this mark, I believe that this is why I say that the, the central banks of the world will have these digital currencies and it's going to go that way. But what it does is it gives them even more power in ways that, that they've never had because everything will be monitored and tracked and, and be able to be seen. And so if somebody isn't abiding by the rules, so to speak, or what have you, or at that point it gets to where you're not taking the mark, then you can be shut off and uh, you won't be able to buy or sell. So, so that's what I see. That's how I kind of feel like we're moving. Um, that's not to, to be in fear or anxiety. I just think it's, the reality, but I also, as you've heard me talk about, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I do believe 
Christ is coming for his church because I believe he, he we're his bride and and we're not appointed to wrath. And that seven years is very specific in that it's the wrath of God being poured out on a Christ rejecting world. It's not it's not just the normal little tribulation that he said we'd face in this world. We will face tribulation, small case T of Ellipsis, the the pressure, the tensions, the the enemy, the oppression that comes from the devil. But but the seven years that we're being talked about here, those last seven years that are appointed for the nation of Israel, are are not just the devil <laughs> oppressing us. It's actually God judging the world for Christ, you know, for rejecting Christ. So I don't believe as his bride we would be we'd be under that judgment. So so that's kind of how I see us moving. Um, but but you know, in the meantime, that's that's where I see the technology moving and getting us to a place where they can control people a lot better. That's why we see so much of the control. And, and I don't know if I said this when I was with you last time, but this really struck me. I was talking to somebody recently about it, and, and what we know is basically what we're moving back towards is, is Babylon. We're moving back towards the Babylonian, you know, one world, everything where man is in charge, man's in control. And so... Um, when you think about that, you understand that ultimately Satan is is ruling and reigning in that in that situation because he wants to be God. He's always wanted to be God. He's he's trying to take that place, and and since he couldn't be God in this world, he's he's desired to be God in the hearts and lives of man, and that's what's happened. People are worshiping him now. When I say that, it's not like literally they're offering sacrifices on you know an altar of something, and there's a picture of Satan. You know, it's not like that, but. But when you are adhering to serving yourself and serving the flesh and and basically working for this world system, you're serving the devil. You're you're working for him. You're either for God or you're against him. And and if you're serving yourself in the world, then you're working on his behalf. And that's what we're seeing with mankind right now is we can do this without God. That's basically the government systems of the world. We can do this without God. We don't need God. And so that's why you see such a push towards global, you know, climate crisis and all this kind of stuff, because it's this idea that we have to protect ourselves, even though God in, in Genesis 8 said, as long as the earth, I want to read this to you, actually, um, because it just, it really, God said this, okay, for any who are worried about the climate right now, let me just say what God told us. He said, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, this is uh, Genesis 8, 21 and 22 nor will i again destroy every living living thing as i have done while the earth remains seed time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer and day and night shall not cease so in other words god's saying i got this it's mine i made it i can take care of it i don't need you guys to help me honestly it's all good and and really that's what it says in colossians 1 16 you know he is the one who holds it all together and so that again, but what we see, what we see with the climate stuff, and you'll see this more and more, it's happening, the Green Deal and all this stuff, it's just driving agendas. They're using it to accomplish more agendas that they have for things that they want to get accomplished to move towards a one world, because we all have to support each other, we all have to look out for one another, we're global citizens, we kind of look out for Mother Earth, compared to the fact that it's Father God who created the heavens and the earth. Um, but nonetheless, that's where we're at. So I'll stop there. Um, yeah so somebody yep there you go uh hmm. yeah how long is a generation uh that's that's a good question um the bible i think it, it can be anywhere from kind of 70 years to 100 years I, that's at least my estimation in light of um and this isn't setting dates at all it's just the fact that the only place the, the maximum being uh, being um 100 comes from genesis 15 when it says to when god's talking to abraham and he says um now as for you you shall go to your fathers in peace you shall be buried at a good old age but in the fourth generation they shall return here for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet complete so fourth generation or 400 years is what God was saying to him there. So the idea that a generation could be a hundred years is kind of, kind of the max. Um, so yeah. Uh, again, I think that that tells you and me, we're definitely somewhere close. I think we're pretty close uh, to, to the Lord's return and to all these things unfolding. So it just, just keep us ever the more vigilant. Um 
you know, somebody's asked, how, how do we as the church, John and Sarah, how do we as the church respond as we will be raptured? You know, this is this is what I've been really praying about a lot lately. And, and I especially, I, I, I work with uh, young adults quite a bit. And with Behold Israel, we're doing a weekly young adults discipleship, YOD, uh, we call it young adults discipleship, um, Zoom call. So that's something actually, if you know some young adults who it would be a blessing, it's for young people all over the world. We meet every Tuesday. Um, you can find it on our, on our, you know, Instagram or on our Facebook. And, um, we've seen just how isolated a lot of these young people feel and are, and our there's mental health is just being attacked, you know, big time. And so we just want to keep encouraging them. And, and one of the things that I've seen for young adults, especially right now is the kind of a hopelessness, you know, it's like, what, what, what's, what, what future is there for me anymore? Like my own son, my 19 year old son, you know, I took him to California. Part of that is because there's, he's struggling. Like this has been hard. It's been a hard, hard season. And, um, what we see is, and this is what I kind of felt like God gave me some encouragement about a month ago towards this point, because yeah, what we find is we kind of have our preconceived ideas of what the future looks like, and we want to make plans, and we have desires, but but what we have to keep in mind is as we read through the scriptures, and we look at the stories of Daniel, we look at the story of Esther, we look at the story of Joseph, and you realize that they didn't have it easy. Life wasn't, you know, simple. And, and even, you know, you look, I mean, I'm talking about young adults in that specific situation, those different people. But then you look at Paul and you look at the fact that this was during the Roman Empire where it was hugely oppressive, you know, like, and, and so people throughout the scriptures have lived in very difficult days and very difficult times. And yet God's purpose, because purposes continued to be accomplished through those seasons. If anything, it kind of works as a refining process, doesn't it? A refiner's fire where what's really important lasts and the stuff that maybe was a bit trivial that we just kind of got involved with because we had extra time or we were living in luxury starts to kind of fall by the wayside. We go, that's actually not that important. What's really important is eternity and what, what we're doing for eternity. And I feel like that's the season we find ourselves in today where God's saying, listen, each and every one of you, every single one of you who's on this call today and for all of us as, Bi as Bible believing Christians, he brought us into, I think we got to remember this, God's in charge, right? He, his days, he's numbered our days and, and he brought us into the world at this moment in time. He knew what was going to be going on right now. And I think we need to be reminded of that because that means he's equipped us. He's called us. He says, you're my workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which I've prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So what does that mean for us today? I think it means we need to seek the Lord. God, what is it that you have for me to do? I know life isn't the same as it was. Like, it's not as easy to do this. It's not as, it's more challenging to do that. But what does that mean? How do I maybe pivot at this time? Am I, you know, some of you who are into the, in the business world, you know that startup companies, this happens all the time, where they start out with an idea and they're moving in this direction. And then all of a sudden they realize the the demand within the, in the, you know, um, the market is a bit different so they make a bit of a pivot and go oh this is what we're actually are going to do and and honestly it feels like the lord is maybe challenging all of us in in that way too where it's like are your eyes wide open to look at what is the lord doing at this moment and how do you get involved with it how do you make yourself available to minister in a way that might look different than you would have ever imagined or expected i mean I guess I could say what we're doing right this minute is an example of that. Like we're, we're literally spending time on a zoom call, which, which we wouldn't, you know, I, and I saw people from, you know, who are in Portugal or in France who are in South Africa, like India, it's cool because although this isn't ideal, our, our circumstances in life, it's caused us to connect in ways maybe we would never would have as a Bible, you know, as believers in this world. And that's good. So we have to see the positives in that. But at the same time, also locally and in different ways, how are we able to reach out? Maybe it has to look different than we ever would have imagined. Maybe we have to get creative. We have to think through ways to do that, to be able to keep bringing the light and bringing the truth to people. Because I get it. Like I, I've, I've, I've battled in this year of like getting kind of discouraged. Like, Lord, this stinks. <laughs> like, if I'm honest, like, this just stinks. I hate this. Like, this isn't nice. Like, I don't like what they're doing. Like, why are they doing this to us? You know, kind of feeling. But then you go, okay, wait, Lord, 
I'm not the first. This isn't, we've had it pretty easy, actually, if we're honest. And, and as we look back on history, we realize there's people who's had a lot harder and yet you use them in very significant ways. So Lord, help us to be sensitive to your leading. Help us to be available vessels that you can use. You brought us into the world for this moment in time. So what does that mean for us? And how do you use us at this very moment? And so I just hope you're encouraged by that thought because God does have, you know, he says, occupy till I come. Don't, don't, don't get weary. And even, you know, when he talks about in Revelation 3.10, and this word has really had to, has challenged me as well, knowing that things would be hard. Basically, God's saying, listen, I know it's not going to be easy for you. But in Revelation 3.10, he says, because you've kept my command to persevere, which means patient endurance. you got to keep going, even in the face of difficulty. I'm also going to keep you. And this is one of the you know things towards the pre-tribulation rapture. I'm going to keep you from, not in, but not through, but from, uh, which means epi, which is, you know, out of the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So that's for those who are, you know, earth dwellers. Behold, uh, behold I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. And and again, I think it started before that with, you know, I'm the God who set before you an open door that no man can shut. So I think that's the encouragement to you and me. We serve a God who can open doors that no man can shut. So, so let's be praying. Let's be asking the Lord, how can you use me at this time that doesn't feel comfortable? It doesn't feel normal, but I guess I have to just be ready for whatever that looks like and whatever that means. And can you open doors that no man can shut? So let me uh, keep going so we don't run out of time. I can try and do as many as we can. Um, When will, when will we see the prophecy in Zechariah 14 come to pass? So I, I alluded to it, and, and Revelation 19 talks to us about the return of Christ to the earth to rule and reign. As I said earlier in John 14, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for the, where I am, there you may be also. In other words, this idea of taking his church, taking his bride, and bringing us to heaven to be with him for that seven-year time, for that marriage supper of the Lamb, for all the things he's promised to us as his bride— but then he's going to come back then to this earth after the judgment has come down for those seven years. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, the millennium, uh, from Jerusalem. And, and that's where it talks about in, in Zechariah 14, his feet touching down on, on the Mount of Olives. And that's where he will judge, you know, the world. And, and there'll be, you know, all the things we see unfolding there at the end of Revelation. So that's that's my understanding of, of how that works. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, That's right. Any other? Uh, I'm just trying to work through all those questions. I think I think that's pretty much most yeah. of what I've seen here. Now, I think you've done a, a, a thorough job there, Jeff. It's, um, it, it's really been great. Uh, I'm just well, looking at the time that's yeah. going on 10 to 12. So yeah, we we'd pray. like to uh, maybe break into... Um, oh, okay. No, uh, we were going to break into to, to pray in small groups. But, uh, yeah, we've only got a few minutes left. So I think 12 o'clock would be a good time to end. I think it's been amazing. Um, someone's laptop's conked out, so and then one other person's dropped out, I think, and that's it. So everyone has stuck the course. So. That's, that's impressive. Well, well I, 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 I applaud you. For, I know I can yeah. wear you out, but I uh, appreciate you hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, no, they've done well. But I, I think it's been very, very informative, a lot for us to digest. And um, just to get the whole thing of the church and Israel and, you know, who's going to be going through the tribulation, who isn't. And we, we're totally 100% behind what you're saying, that God is going to spare us from wrath and we'll be taken out. And um, that the, uh, the Matthew 24 and 25 that people, or 24 especially when they look at that, it's like you said, it's to Israel. Mm. And that's because those people have been left, uh, they're still here, and they've gone into Jacob's trouble. So, yeah. Let's pray. Okay, so we're going to pray now. Um, 
I'm just wondering how to do this. Well, I think we can, let's, um, John will start off. And then if you, we've, we've got about seven minutes. So if you, if you want to add a prayer, just unmute and pray. Leah's got a hand up. Sorry, just before. Leah, did you have a, a final question? Uh, you muted, and yeah, we can't. All right, sorry. I was just going to ask: Is we are going to be raptured? The church will be raptured before the seven years trib, um, the seven years and the tribulation. Is that right? And and the reason I would um one of the, one of the examples of why I would say yes to to your question is one of the reasons is because that seven years is we're told is wrath. It's God's wrath upon a Christ rejecting world. It's his time to draw, you know, the nation of Israel to an understanding of him being the Messiah. But there's another thing from from Revelation, um, and, I, and I just I think this is good for you guys to to hear and understand. Revelation actually comes with its own divine outline. It, it doesn't. God doesn't want it to be too complicated for us. It's supposed to be a revelation. There's supposed to be a blessing. There is a blessing in reading it. So so he. I know a lot of people avoid Revelation because they're like, oh, I don't understand. It's too confusing. It doesn't make sense. But it actually comes with its own divine outline, and it tells us in chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So Paul, so John, writing this, this revelation that God was giving him, basically write the things which you've seen, which is chapter 1, the resurrected Christ. He's now seen Jesus ruling like he is in a resurrected state. So he writes about that, chapter 1, chapter 2. Two and three, it says, and write the things which are. Well, John was writing this in 95 AD when he's there on the island of Patmos. So he's writing about the church age. The two, you know, chapters two through through three are all about the church, right? Talking to you and me. Interesting. And then write the things which will take place after this, which is the word metatauta, which we find at the beginning, interestingly enough, at, at chapter four, that says after these things. So that gives us a clue that that's where that's, that starts, is after these things. What After what things? After the church age is complete, now this is what unfolds next. And this is where we get from chapters four all the way to 19. We have two things happening, one in chapters four and five, and I'll keep it quick because I, I know we want to pray, but I just want to give this quick insight because that question I think is so good, is the fact that chapters four and five are a picture into heaven during this time. And what we find in heaven during this time is we find this group of people who are praising around the throne, and it says this. Now, when he had taken the scroll, we see that Jesus is the only one who was able to take the scroll and loose the seals. Um, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And listen to the song that they sing in heaven, worshiping around the throne. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. What group has been redeemed by God, by the blood of Jesus, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and now are made kings and priests and will reign with him? the church it's you and me and, and so what this is telling us is the church is there in heaven with the lord after the church age is finished before chapter six where the wrath of the lamb is then begins to be poured out for those seven year period of time we're with him in that place of worshiping him and enjoying you know being in his presence as he said we will always be with the lord therefore we comfort one another with these words so i'll i'll, I'll stop yes i think um i think what that is doing is opening a whole lot of other questions and i think we need a whole session just on that so um i think we won't answer there were a couple of other questions that came yeah, up so we better pray. If, we, if we say we're gonna we would love you to come back, Jeff, <laughs> and we'll 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 focus on something like that. But okay. if we could just pray now, let's do it and um, commit this to the Lord. So, John, will you start? Yeah, yeah sure. Hallelujah. Okay, Hallelujah. thank you, Father. We thank you just for the. Hello, uh, the, the phones are going. That's how it always Father, is when we pray. Thank you for the words. Thank you for the the, uh, the revelation that you've spoken to us. Lord, I pray that those words, Father, are eternal seed in each one of our hearts. Father, that they will cause 
understanding. They will cause growth of knowledge in each one. Father, that we will be comforted, we will be gripped and strengthened by that which has been spoken. We thank you so much, Father, that there is a wonderful, wonderful future, a wonderful inheritance for each one of us. And as Jeff has said, Father, now is the time to be looking to the fig tree. Now is the time to be understanding, Father, what it is you're doing, not to be moved by the shakings, not to be moved by uh, what is going to and fro uh, throughout the world, but, Lord, to be looking to you, our, our revelation light, our, our rock, our, our redeemer. We look to you, Lord, and thank you, Father. Thank you so much, Father, for this time together, for this wonderful technology that's been released to us, that we can have all these different countries, Father, in one place, in one meeting. It's just been awesome, Father. So we thank you so much, Father. And Lord, we thank you that now we just open the floor so people can pray what you lay on their hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I, I want to thank you so much for Jeff and this this gift of teaching which you've given him. Lord, we thank you. There's been such right. a deposit today, so much, Lord. And what I, I want to ask is that, Father, the, the, our minds, it would be fertile soil, not only our minds, but our hearts as well. And that, Lord, in these next few days, as we ponder and as we think of what he said, that you, Holy Spirit, would just ignite. You would, those seeds that have been planted, that you would, you would bring them to life. You would increase our understanding. You would increase our revelation. That, Lord, you would take all of us on from this place of understanding, to understand with much greater clarity this time that we're in, how we are to prepare, and where and what we should be doing. So, Lord, we want to bless Jeff and his family and yeah. say thank you, Lord, for this man. Thank you for this gift that you've given him. So just let's stretch out our hands and just let's let's bless Jeff. Thank Heavy you, and John, will you pray? We just want to say thank you, God, for Jeff. We bless him, Lord, to know that he you have sent him for such a time as this. You have sent him to us today to deposit uh, we're pearls of wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we can take hold of and eat and feast on and we just want to say thank you god we bless him we want to say god would you would you increase him would you give him would you give him increase in everything he does multiplication mm -hmm. that lord he would be able to continue and carry on and spread the, the the gospel the way he does and 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 help people to understand with with greater clarity and 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 to search out for themselves help us all lord as we go back now would you speak to us in dreams and in mm -hmm. visions and in your audible voice that we might hear and see what you the spirit is saying that we Amen. might take hold of it and go forwards together with the one heart not on our own agendas not worried about anything that we see in the world but focused entirely on what you the spirit is revealing so we thank you for him we bless him and we 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 de we declare that he will come back he will come back and talk to us again because lord we think you have sent him you have joined our hearts together you have joined him <laughs> us to him so we we thank you for that god and we just want you to bless him his family and and his the, the work you have given him to to complete we just Thank you, God, for him in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for calling your church into maturity. Um, to, um, John Lander. Have... John Lander. Sorry. I can't see everyone. John Lander, would you pray? Yes, thank you. Oh, dear brother, I cannot. I just want to bless you. I just feel that it's it's you're you're a graced man, and and the wealth and the blessing that you're giving to the body of Christ. Yeah, thank I thank you all my heart, and we thank you. And there's an anointing so rich, and your son, oh God, we pray that you'll build up representing all the young men. 
that are in difficult. This is the message of the gospel. Oh God, reach the young men and women of our generations, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And we put, Lord, that grace on this man. Grace to you, brother. Much grace to you. Much, much grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus. Be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank Lord. You. And Brian. Uh, thank you, Lord, for um, bringing your church into maturity and for Jeff for his having ears to hear and the wisdom to and diligence to respond to you um, and to bring your revelation, your wisdom to your church. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. And we just declare again a breakthrough in in Bath, breakthrough in Bath, and and for your favour on Jeff's life. Um, and all you've called him to do, we just declare uh, your glory, Lord, the increase, increase from glory to glory in his life. We thank you, Lord, for our inheritance in you, um, for all you have planned and that you have good plans for us all in, the, in this season to come. We thank you, Lord, for that wisdom and revelation from you and that we would, um, as Heather and John have, have prayed, that we would ponder, that we would um, respond wisely to what you're revealing in in this season thank you lord thank you lord for for your plans for our lives amen yeah amen so thank you father thank you father your blessings on each and everyone who's participated and heard this morning we thank you for your grace and peace father your presence in and with every single one this is your blessing lord we thank you for it Amen. So thanks everyone. Thanks for coming along, sharing with uh, us all. You know, the meetings that we have, I know it's lovely to have a speaker, but if we didn't have listeners, guess what? <laughs> it just wouldn't work. So I just commend every one of you for, for sticking it out and listening.